Okay, we have two questions online to start with. Okay. Uh, the first question is, any estimation on how large a spill has to be to be considered significant to a community population's effect? One gallon, 10,000 gallons, one, mil one million gallons, et cetera. <laughs> Dr. Pinckney, can you hear us? I think it all depends on the system and the residence time and the mixing that occurs. Um, I, I, you know, these large disastrous oil spills are, are bad, but you know, when you look at the quantities, they're the small spills that are chronic exposures to a lot of these communities. And so um, I think any spill, uh, depending on what the, the type of oil that it is, whether it's a refined or, or a crude oil product or um, how long the organisms are actually exposed is, is, is just as important as how big the spill is. Yeah. And I would add that it also depends on what population you're talking about, what species you're talking about, some things are more sensitive than others. It's definitely context dependent. It's a, it's a hard question to answer because of that. I also would add, um, not in terms of community and population structure, but to be wary of the media, and they'll have different, um, I guess, thresholds for what they call a large or a medium or a small spill that it is context dependent. So make sure you're checking your source on uh, what a large spill really is. Turning y'all around. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. The second question. Would you read it into the microphone since you can see it up there? I'll move it back where you can see it. Uh, so the next question is based on area coverage or percent of area covered by oil. How do we take the lab data and transition it to field decision making? That's part of what we try to do with our Dr. Ackerman, what are your thoughts on why the Deepwater Horizon scat oiling categories didn't match sediment TPH levels? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, their oil tends to be really patchy distributed, so even though a severe category might be representative of a larger area that someone is looking at, it, it's still possible to find areas within that coastline that may not have as much oil. Um, it's also really volatile components, so over time, Distribution, but also the fact that um, sometimes it's hard to, to visually 
Anybody in the room have questions? I have one. Sure. This has, you did your study on the beans and what was going on with the really fish and everything. Has anything been done studying the effects of other fish or birds that eat those fish? Absolutely. Um, there's been studies on red drum, which are of particular interest, where they've done adult exposures. Um, the problem with doing exposures with larger fish, which other labs do, is you have to make a large volume of oil, and you somehow have to consistently make that oil um, in terms of composition. As Dr. Hoffman alluded to, even in a lab setting, maintaining a constant oil concentration is very difficult. So usually what they'll do is like a dosing every four days um, where they'll hit the adults. Um, Red right drum, they've done Mahi Mahi, uh, Dr. Martin in Florida has um, over time, if you follow the, the oil concentration, you can see this deep quality in oil constituents. So, yes, it has been done in other fish. There have been incidences of reproductive um, inhibition problems with the vascular system. Uh, my question didn't deal with the oil effect of the oh, bigger okay. fish, but the bigger fish eating the smaller fish. Oh. If that had any effect on the bigger fish. Well, absolutely. not part of. Oh, as far as experimentally doing it, well, you always have potential for bioaccumulation. Um, of course, that's kind of the idea when you go out to the field. Uh, typically, you don't want to eat the old fish. They've been around, they've seen some stuff. They've been able to accumulate, um, you know, whether it's oil or any other intoxicant that's in, in the environment. Um, so there's absolutely potential for that. Um, in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, it was just, it was so spatially um, different portions of the coastline had such different levels of exposure. I, can, I can't tell you specifically um, to what extent that one is, but it's absolutely possible. Yes. So I actually was wondering, you are talking uh, especially Dr. Um, about the difference between the SCAT surveys and the pH and the skin and the sediments. How much do you think um, sediment characteristics have anything to do with pH is actually being well in the sediments? Obviously, um, each is the catch the distribution of their grain size distributions and other levels of organics, etc., that are in your actual sediment samples. So do we know how those other sediment characteristics might have contributed to the retention of pH as being in the sediments or the yeah, like, washing out? Or in general, I would think like the final particulates would hang on to the oil more. You're going to see it more readily incorporated into those types of substrates. Um, so arguably, a more like, more impact on this type of experience. That might be like where there's some disconnect potentially. I could see like if a sketch team was out there and they assessed an area being like impacted, but it may be like very different set of characteristics than other areas. Would that create this disconnect between what those teams? Yeah, but in general, uh, I don't know, there would tend to be a lot of variability in terms of the spatial and temporal frequency just because it was sort of an on fly operation and it's a little bit unpredictable. So a lot of times those observations would be meant to represent a fairly large area and it could be that they covered different substrate types. Um, in general, though, the sediment that was compared to that category was sampled from within the same range. So too much, um, but yes, there were some cases in which those distributions covered a fairly large area. Um, just a statement, if y'all could repeat the question or summarize the question to the people online can't hear what's being said in the audience. That was another question about um, SCAT category discrepancy based on the particular data and the grain size of the system. Next thing for over 10 years since the Water Horizon blew out, do you think we have seen the biological effects or do we, should we expect to see additional effects biologically? Especially where the fishing is concerned. That's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, so the question was, have we seen uh, the biological effects? Um, have we seen the peak in the, in the negative impacts? Um, and, and I would say that after the Exxon Valdez spill, the crash didn't occur until something like eight years after. So I'm, I'm really wary to say this is over, uh, especially because a lot of the oil gets down in the southern. So you can go to Ixtoc, Exxon Valdez, and you can still dig up oil. You can go to Barataria Bay and still dig up oil, and it looks like fresh oil. It has weather. It's got all those volatile, nasty compounds. So if a hurricane comes in and resuspends everything, redistributes it, you can have this all over again. Not to mention that there are a fair number Is there a certain time of the year or situation, scenario, whatever you call it, that would have an estuary being more naturally protected from an oil spill? On an, on an immediate, because where I come, what, what I'm looking at is more of, okay, this time of the year I've got to worry about mainly birds or fish or, or is there a time where I'm going to be able to step in and say, okay, it's a little bit more protected right now as opposed to six months from now? Yeah, so I mean, I think this gets to some transport circulation issues and so, I mean, if it's not a subsurface oil spill and you're dealing with just surface oil, you know, the spring discharge periods are going to be pushing a lot of fresh water out of these systems, and the surface circulation is primarily going to be pushing things out. And so you're less likely to get water in train in estuaries during spring or high flow seasons um, relative to drier seasons where um, they're going to be more susceptible to um, material moving. So I think there's at least some uh, seasonality. Uh, you know, a lot of the Northern Gulf has a seasonality to the coastal circulation. So depending on where you are relative to an offshore oil spill, you may not have to worry about oil. This is what we saw with deep water horizon. Texas really didn't get hit very hard. Really, I don't even know if Texas got hit at all by the this oil spill. That was because the spill happened in April. The seasonal circulation in the Northern Gulf is currents tend to go from west to east, and so that's why uh, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi, sort of after Louisiana, and those are the states that got hit, is because the seasonal circulation goes from west to east. So it put those systems at more at risk than sort of the Texas area. And so there is seasonality in a lot of certain uh, aspects of coastal circulation. And so you know, understanding river discharge, understanding shelf circulation, very helpful to sort of assessing when, where you need to put your response efforts. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, I don't even remember what the exact question I think was. he was probably close enough that oh, people could hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's what, it's the people in the very back of the room that the mic yeah. can't pick up. Right. Um, I do have a question speaking of submerged aquatic vegetation. Actually, walk over. <laughs> Talk. <laughs> Um, so my question is that you showed that there was some, um, when some of the submerged aquatic vegetation was exposed to oil, they have shallower roots, um, so that obviously it has impacts on um, their stability within the system and uh, assuming erosion impacts as well. Uh, has there been any studies as far as how, I mean, like, total spatial impact, how that would occur, or is it just no, no, no. There's not been any, uh, field-based studies, because submerged vegetation is pretty hard to monitor, right? So we, around here, it's, it's turned to water, so you can't do aerial surveys very efficiently. You have to do diver-based, core-based estimates, and it would, it would take a long time and pretty costly in, in field efforts. So for that reason, the submerged part of vegetation, in general in this area, is not monitored as well as submerged vegetation. So, mm -hmm. so that's sort of a gap in our knowledge that you know, we could try to address in the future. Two questions for Charles. Do you know whether larger herbivores also prefer oiled vegetation over non oiled vegetation, or is this behavior only seen in anthropods? And do you think that because they are eating less than they normally would, uh, there's not as much of an impact to their health? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And 
I'm okay saying I don't know. <laughs> um, in, in terms of mammals, uh, manatees, um, I don't know of any studies showing manatee preference for oiled areas, unoiled areas. Um, and then the long-term effects of eating this oiled vegetation, how does that, how does an oiled plant you know, function nutritionally for later in life? And that, that those are great questions that if you have some money, I'd be happy to do some <laughs> studies. <laughs> Thank you for the question.